So good afternoon. Um, I'm Yasmin Probst. I'm an Associate Professor at the School of Medical, Indigenous and Health Sciences here at the University of Wollongong, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar this afternoon. Now, the Luminary series brings together uh, leading researchers, industry experts and thought leaders for a one-hour conversation every fortnight. And we discover how research and collaboration at the University of Wollongong with our research partners is tackling global issues. Today, we're going to hear from some of my colleagues, my exceptional colleagues, um, as we discuss the role of lifestyle self-management for people living with multiple sclerosis. But before we start, um, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge our beautiful country. So on behalf of the university, I'd like to acknowledge that country for people, Aboriginal people is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. From Sydney to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast, from freshwater to bitter water to salt, from city to urban to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept, us alive, kept alive the relationship between all living things. The university acknowledges the devastating impact of, these, of colonization on the campus's footprint, and we commit ourselves to telling truth telling, healing, and education. Now, thank you to those who've joined and mentioned their location in the chat. Um, I can see we've got a number of different attendees coming through um, from a number of different locations, and hopefully you've got the privilege of having a beautiful country as much as we do here in Wollongong. Now, to give a little bit of background uh, about our topic today, multiple sclerosis is a chronic neurodegenerative disease with unique expression in each individual. And I'm actually joining you today as a person living with MS, and I'll share along the way some of my experiences in this journey. But modifying lifestyle is something that many of us face at varying points in the journey, these modifications are considered a form of self-management of the disease. It has the potential to improve our symptoms, to slow the progress, and just generally make us feel better. <laughs> um, but the reason we're running today's session in May is it's a really important month for the MS community. Globally, MS organisations host what we call a May 50K, and this is a fundraising event to support research towards finding a cure eventually um, for multiple sclerosis. Now, the month culminates with World MS Day on the 30th, and it's a day of celebration and awareness raising with the theme of connection. And I think today's webinar is a really nice showcase of our connection. And it will show some of the, um, the other people that I've worked with and we cover the topic of lifestyle self-management MS as an adjunct to first-line pharmaco pharmacological therapies. Now, healthy lifestyles are becoming increasingly recognized in a number of spaces and in the general population, as well as the MS community, there's evidence. However, in MS, um, the evidence for that is highly variable. So I'll move on to our clinicians. We have a panel of uh, clinicians and researchers today, and we'll talk through this topic. But I'll start with our panel firstly. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Claudia Mark, uh, who's a Senior Research Fellow with the Disability and Health Unit at the University of Melbourne. And we also have Dr. Yvonne Lemont, a Senior Lecturer and Physiotherapist specialising in Neurology at the Perrin Institute for Neurological and Translational Science at Murdoch University. And then I'll join in my role here at the University of Wollongong as a Senior Research Fellow. And I'm also an advanced accredited practicing dietitian. Um, and I'll wear my possibly hat as well um, of a lived, person with lived experience. The three of us will talk through our um, experience and our research in the space of lifestyle self-management, uh, but we'll also be complimented first up by our two presenters from the Eat Right MS team here at Wollongong. Now, Karen and Olivia, Karen Zozak and Olivia Wills are two of our doctoral candidates. And first up today, we'll be hearing from Karen and some of her PhD research findings to date. I'll hand over to you, Karen. Thank you, Yasmin. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So my background is, a, is in clinical dietetics and I'm in the second year of my PhD at the University of Wollongong. The aim of my research is to help people living with MS and also health, healthcare professionals navigate dietary advice for MS. Okay, so just starting off with the definition, what is multiple sclerosis? MS is an immune mediated disease of the central nervous system. So involving the brain, the spinal cord and the optic nerves. It involves inflammatory and progressive processes, and this results in demyelination and leads to impaired nerve conduction. And that results in a range of symptoms that you can see here on the right-hand side. Now, I just want to emphasize that symptoms and disease course um, are highly individual. So no two people with MS have the same experience. So what about diet and MS? 
At this point in time, there's not enough evidence to recommend any particular diet for MS. So the recommendation is therefore to consume a balanced diet in accordance with national dietary guidelines. Now, we also know that people living with MS are at increased risk of malnutrition, and that's because of symptoms like dysphagia, also fatigue, changes to mobility and changes to GI function. So we want to promote nutritional adequacy in people living with MS. Now, we also have emerging evidence that outcomes in MS are poorer in the presence of comorbidities. So comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, high cholesterol as well. So if we can control these comorbidities using medical nutrition therapy, so dietary interventions, then we have a greater chance of better outcomes in MS as well. So I just wanna to highlight to you the relationship between these three things. Dietary guidelines promote nutritional adequacy and also underpin medical nutrition therapy. So if we can move towards a balanced diet, then we can hit on these other two goals as well. So I just wanna to touch on information seeking as well. People with MS have reported that the dietary advice that they received around the time of their diagnosis has been inadequate or has been non-specific. So they didn't feel that it applied to them and therefore it limited their acceptance. So this has pushed them towards seeking information online. The problem with this is that online information can be unreliable, it can be contradictory, and it also can be difficult to read. And that can be a problem for people who have limited health literacy. So understandably, this has led to confusion in people who are seeking this information online. The other problem is that diets promoted for MS online can be restrictive. So this carries an increased risk of nutritional deficiencies. And this is something that we definitely don't wanna promote in people who are already at increased risk of malnutrition. So that brings me to uh, where my research starts. So I'm aiming to answer these questions here as part of four studies. So firstly, identifying the diets that are promoted for MS, gathering the evidence for these diets, developing a way to compare these diets with Australian dietary guidelines, and also exploring associations between these diets and outcomes in MS. So at this point in time, I'm just wrapping up the first study. So that's the one that I'm going to be taking you through today. So how do we answer the question, what diets are promoted for MS? How do we answer this? The starting point for this study has been the internet. So my aim is to simulate an online search for dietary advice for MS conducted by a regular person and to evaluate the content. So to undertake this study, I used several different tools. I focused on Google and Bing because they are the most popular search engines in Australia. I looked at Twitter as well because the content of Twitter is open and it's accessible unlike other platforms um, that have closed groups like Facebook. And I also considered ChatGPT because this is an emerging tool and it's something that people are increasingly likely to be using. All right, so here we have the inputs and outputs of the three different um, searches that I used. So as you can see on the left-hand side, we've got search terms. So for Google and Bing, I used Google Trends to inform the search terms, and that resulted in 73 web pages. And I took three pages of results for search engine. For Twitter, you can see the search phrase on the left, and that resulted in 93 tweets, and I took a month's worth of data for Twitter. And ChatGPT, a nice and simple situation there. So just one question and a single response as well. All righty. So looking now at the web page characteristics, almost half of the web pages were updated in the last five years, but this means that the other half had content that was potentially much older than this. Around half provided the author name and credentials, and I looked at this information because studies had indicated that people with MS are using this to judge the credibility of the information that they're looking at in front of them. Over 80% made health-related claims. Now, by claims, I mean the positive or negative effect of foods and nutrients on outcomes in MS, comorbidities, or nutritional status. But only 40% provided citations, so this indicates that there's a mismatch between claims that are being made online and the evidence that's being provided to support those claims. Over 80% did include a recommendation for a diet for MS, and we'll take a look at that on the next slide. 
and only half recommended consulting a healthcare professional before making dietary changes. All right, so having a look at the dietary advice now, the most recommended eating pattern for MS, so over 40% of recommendations was for a balanced diet. And this is more closely aligned with dietary guidelines than other eating patterns. And I've listed some of them here on the right. So we've got the Walls diet, which is a Paleolithic style diet, Swank, which is low fat, fasting and ketogenic approaches, which are low carbohydrate, and also the OMS diet, which is a low saturated fat diet. So these diets on the right, not only attracted recommendations, but at times they received cautions and that just depended on the source of the information. So you can see here, we've got five different eating patterns and this is just the top five, there were more. Um, and we've got recommendations and we have cautions as well. So it's not surprising that people who are jumping online to have a look at what they should be doing with their diet are becoming confused. So moving on to Twitter and ChatGPT, the most tweeted diets were keto, walls, fasting, and overcoming MS. So this is broadly aligned with the results from search engines. And ChatGPT did recommend a balanced diet and a healthy weight, so aligned with dietary guidelines here in Australia. But it did also acknowledge that for saturated fat and omega-3, more research was required to understand the role of these nutrients um, in MS. ChatGPT also recommended engaging with a health healthcare professional, um, in particular for individualized nutrition care. So it was encouraging to see that that recommendation was there. The one thing that wasn't there was the recommendation for dairy as part of a balanced diet. So all of the other food groups were covered, but not this one. So not only did it omit dairy, but it also didn't mention non-dairy sources for that food group. So we have an entire food group here that's been omitted. Um, that's concerning because people coming along looking for advice might all of a sudden think they need to exclude that food group. So that's clearly a risk of harm to that person. Now, this illustrates the capacity for ChatGPT to spread misinformation, and that's a concern that has been reflected in the press as well, so amongst researchers and market analysts. So as cl clinicians and researchers, it's just something to, we need to be aware of going forward. So the implications for this study, people who are searching for dietary advice for MS online are most likely to find recommendations for a balanced diet, but they are also likely to come across recommendations for restrictive eating patterns. So navigating dietary advice for MS online continues to be characterized by information that can be unreliable, it can be contradictory, and it has the potential to be unsafe as well. So where to from here? Now that these diets have been identified, the next step is to conduct a literature review um, to gather the evidence for these diets and also to develop a scoring tool. Um, and this scoring tool will allow comparison of these diets with the Australian Dietary Guidelines in terms of degree of adherence. A little bit further down the track, so looking more towards next year, exploring associations between these diets and outcomes in MS. So that brings me to the end of my update. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat um, so I can address them in the Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. Over to you, Yasmin. You'd think by now I've learned, would have learned to unmute myself on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand over quickly to Olivia, who will be talking to us a little bit more broadly about some other lifestyle areas. Um, over to you, Liv. Thanks, Yasmin. So my name is Olivia, and I'm also a second year PhD student at the University of Wollongong. And I'm also currently working as a dietitian in the private sector as well. And before I jump into my research today, I wanted to provide a bit of a background um, as to why I'm conducting this research. I have a very strong passion for holistic lifestyle management of many chronic conditions. And of course, I've got an extremely special interest in multiple sclerosis. So I'm going to tell you a story today, essentially about my research so far. And for me, it makes sense to start on the first page, which is really unpacking this idea of brain health. 
So the idea of brain health actually began in the gerontology and dementia literature in the very late 1980s. And it was really centered and focused around the outcome of cognition as a main focus in dementia. So cognitive decline or cognitive impairment. In 2010, the idea of brain health was actually extended to neurodegenerative disease more broadly. And that is evidenced by quite a, a range of worldwide health initiatives. And one example is the World Health Organization's brain health position statement. And that actually classifies brain health as a current global priority. Now, in 2015, a group of international MS experts, including neurologists, MS nurses, allied health professionals, and of course, people with the lived experience, all met and joined in the UK to develop this set of guidance documents um, or guidelines to really promote optimal brain health for people living with MS. And this report highlights the importance of time. So time to diagnosis, time or early initiation to DMTs or treatment therapies for people with MS. And the third branch is actually a new area of research, which is the adoption of a brain healthy lifestyle. Now, at the moment, we don't have one single comprehensive universal definition of brain health, which has made these preliminary research and readings actually quite challenging. So why am I interested in brain, brain health, you might be asking um, or thinking. Now, this graph on the screen shows the change in brain health over time for someone living with MS compared to um, an aging population without MS. So brain health and this theory exists that brain health can originally buffer or compensate for decline in brain reserve, which you can see in this preclinical phase on the screen here. Now, the idea is once this level of brain health is completely exhausted, there is a decline in MS outcomes at a, map, or at a rapid rate, and this is at a, at a much faster rate compared to the normal aging population. So specific to MS, this has been associated with advancing disability or disease progression, outcomes of quality of life and cognitive impairment again. So my research, I thought, why don't we take a step back and look at how we can improve or increase our level of brain health. And at the moment, that's through the adoption of a brain healthy lifestyle. So the MS Brain Health Initiative actually identifies six key recommendations under this umbrella brain healthy lifestyle recommendation. And that includes keeping physically active, maintaining a healthy weight, keeping your mind active, so doing puzzles and challenges and reading books, avoiding smoking, limiting alcohol intake and managing comorbidities. Now, interestingly, the role of diet has been overlooked in these six key recommendations. And as we just nicely heard from Karen, there is a multitude of factors and reasons why dietary advice and following a healthy diet is important for people with multiple sclerosis. So this led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So over the journey of my PhD so far, I've slowly been finding these pieces to the puzzle. And like I've mentioned at the beginning, brain health, this idea of brain healthy living is an evolving concept, as is the importance of time in multiple sclerosis. Now, lots of research is advocating for a combination of pharmaceutical therapies in combination with lifestyle modifications, because we actually know that people with MS are interested in changing their lifestyle, because that's an element of control under, or out of this uncontrollable disease. Dietary modification, interestingly, is actually one of the most common lifestyle changes that people with MS seek post-diagnosis, but unfortunately, dietary guidance has been overlooked, and at times, the role of a dietitian is undervalued in the MS care team. So to situate you in my PhD so far, I will also be explaining the results of my first review, where I've conducted a scoping review to really loosely unpack this idea of brain health in the MS literature and what the recommendations are currently stating for brain healthy living. And this has informed um, the remaining of my PhD, which I can explain at the end of this presentation as well. 
So I chose a scoping review as the most appropriate synthesis type. You might be familiar with a systematic review, which is quite a rigorous process, which uses a, a rigorous PICO question or research question, which we actually found was quite challenging in this space because it's still emerging literature. So, so far I have conducted an in-depth grey literature and peer reviewed both database and internet search and have obtained any article or evidence source that really unpacks this idea of brain health or brain healthy lifestyle with the only exclusion criteria being paediatric MS. A three-stage screening process I have conducted already and I've used the online data management software called Covidence. Charting categories were derived from previous recommendations and all of the results I have qualitatively interpreted. So to give you quite a brief overview of what I've found so far, I've actually retrieved 59 evidence sources that met the inclusion criteria for this review and I've synthesized um, thematically. So interestingly and um, incredibly, there were actually 34 dif different definitions of brain health proposed in the literature. So of course, this is already creating great confusion about this homogenous element of what is brain health, especially in this population. And I have identified and um, analysed these under four key umbrella themes. So the first one, which is probably the most common definition, relates to brain health as a level of function for people with MS. And it relates to the idea or the mechanism of brain reserve, or that's also inter interchangeably known as cognitive reserve as well. Uh, which explains that brain health can buffer or compensate for decline in any given function. Now, just as important, brain health also alludes to the idea of structure of the brain, so preserving neuropathology, and at times some of these definitions actually use outcomes or objective indices of disability in MS, so that might be something like lesion count and load or whole brain volume. Now, importantly, brain health has been identified to be interrelated across multiple domains. So the biggest one being cognition, but then also interpreting um, and incorporating social health, mental health, physical and emotional. And probably my most favourite is that brain health, of course, is essential for overall health and at times is actually identified as a prerequisite for health as well. Now, regarding the brain healthy lifestyle recommendations, I've identified 16 that are coming through from the literature so far, and I've highlighted these top three. So physical activity, smoking cessation and a healthy diet, as of course, this nicely reflects the panel discussion that we've got coming next. But physical activity was way out in the lead at 35 evidence sources recommending to keep physically active and fit to nurture brain health. And one study actually recommended up to four hours of moderate to vigorous exercise on a weekly basis. 21 evidence sources suggested to completely avoid smoking to improve MS outcomes and delay progression to an extent. And healthy diet was mentioned in most cases to that extent only, with no further clarification of what a healthy diet is, but at times did allude to general balanced eating um, and on the minimal a Mediterranean dietary pattern as well. So the next stages of my research is to more so move this concept of brain healthy lifestyle and brain healthy living from just textbooks and evidence sources into the real world. So I'm speaking with clinicians about their roles in supporting people living with MS and their value on holistic lifestyle management. We've also run a clinical, uh, clinical case study with 12 participants that we followed over a period of 12 months and have obtained different elements of lifestyle management data and objective indices of disability as well. And the final purpose to really find that, that missing piece to the puzzle at the beginning of the presentation is to develop a framework for homogenous reporting outcomes of brain healthy living um, and homogenous brain healthy lifestyle recommendations to help consumer um, engagement with this area of research and really again advocate for the importance of diet in holistic lifestyle management. I'll hand it back to Yasmin now to begin the panel discussion. Thank you. That was a nice little segue across to our panel. So what we'll do now is uh, Claudia, Yvonne, and I will um, work through some question and answers in relation to self-management. 
And we'll be looking at smoking cessation, regular exercise, and improved health, uh, healthy food choices for people with MS. If you do have any additional questions to ones posed to us, um, just pop them into the Q&A um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll have, our, have Olivia and Karen ask those of our panel. What I'll do is I'll hand over um, the MC role now to Olivia and Karen. Great, thank you, Yasmin. So the first question I have for you, um, or for all of you, is what do we already know about the changes that people with MS make regarding their lifestyle? Well, I guess if I you know, jump right into it, um, from personal experience, I know it was one of those points of what do I even do here? Um, so my natural instinct was to go back to where I felt comfortable, which for me as a dietitian is food. So what, what am I eating that's doing things to my body? Why, why is this happening to me? And what else do I need to do? And I think then it was just an overwhelming sense of, my goodness, this is lifelong. I don't know what else I need to do. I'm just going to dig a big hole and hide for a while. <laughs> um, so making lifestyle changes for me at the beginning was really not um, what I guess people would like to see happening. Um, but then if I put my clinician hat on, we do know that a lot of people do make dietary changes quite early on in their diagnosis, so within those first five years, um, and they find any information that they can, whether it be from friends and family, whether it be from the internet like Karen was talking to us about, um, or whether it be from their healthcare professionals. They are far and varied um, and not necessarily always uh, adhered to ideally, but we definitely know there are some changes that happen in the food space. And I'm not sure if that happens in the exercise space quite as much, does it, Yvonne? Um, thanks, Yasmin. No, perhaps a little less so. Um, as, you're, as you're sort of speaking about, there's a lot of, a lot of information to understanding life, lifestyle changes that we need to think about if, when we're first diagnosed with MS. And if physical activity and exercise can be something that people think about changing or think about maintaining at that early stage in diagnosis um, and maintaining that across um, the rest of their life, I think it would be advantageous. So I think it's sensible to have those discussions with your clinicians and asking them, potentially what is appropriate when it comes to exercise and physical activity, um, even at the start when you are first learning about um, having MS. So I guess when it comes to smoking and MS, we don't actually have a lot of data to, to tell us whether people with MS are more likely to smoke um, and whether they, you know, they quit and at what point uh, during the disease they do that. Um, what we do know from one of the studies that I conducted a couple of years ago, which was a, a survey of people with MS, some people who smoked and some people who had quit previously, um, is that in terms of preferences, I think about 65% indicated that they would have liked to hear about the benefits of quitting smoking within the first month of diagnosis. Um, so you know, that's that's in hindsight, so you never know whether they thought that was a good idea at the time, but in hindsight, they said, I would have liked to know what the benefits of quitting smoking were going to be on my MS in the first month of diagnosis. Any other a, point? Quite a bit of variation that happens there between our different areas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Shall we move on to the next question? Yeah, please do. How do recommendations differ for people with MS compared to the general population? Um, well, I can be very quick. Yeah. Because <laughs> right. uh, for the, you know, when it comes to tobacco smoking, uh, it's the same for people with MS as for people without MS. Um, it's basically to not, not smoke. Um, I guess with the added advice for people with MS to also avoid passive smoking, because there's been some studies that have shown that also passive smoking, um, it can actually increase the risk of onset of MS, but it can also um, it can also impact on your health outcomes. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here as well. So in terms of physical activity, so for the general population, that varies for children, um, for adults between 18 and 64, and then for older adults. We don't have differentiation like that for recommendations for people living with MS. 
Um, but as we know, the majority of those will fall into the age category between 18 and 64. So actually the, the recommendations don't differ that much from the general population recommendations. And for people living with MS, I think we're, we're encouraging them to achieve a minimum of two sessions of aerobic exercise a week for around about half an hour. And that can be achieved through simply walking at a reasonable good pace. Um, but also it's important to remember that completing strength training. So this could be body weight exercise or it could be exercise with weights or with machines or really just functional um, strength-based exercise around the house is important to include twice a week. Of course, there are some, some experiences and symptoms that people with MS will have that the general population don't. So when it comes to uh, balance exercises and exercise to increase flexibility, those should be incorporated daily for people living with MS. So the recommendations aren't that different. But also, if you're already achieving those levels of exercise, and some people might be, you can actually be aiming to do a little bit more. So if you're already achieving those two sessions a week of aerobic exercise, you could be doing it on more occasions. And for people who are actively exercising, you want to be targeting doing five sessions a week of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise and always remembering the importance of strength training. Well, in the nutrition space, um, I think Karen's touched on it quite nicely with her presentation, but we don't have any advice. We, <laughs> there are no guidelines for a magic diet. There are no guidelines for an ideal eating pattern. It's still all very early stage. Um, the best evidence we have at the moment is for people to follow the national dietary guidelines of the country that they belong to. Um, because those are really developed based on evidence-based information and generally are quite rigorous in their development process. So until we figure out what that best practice approach to eating is for MS, I think that's the safest pathway to go down. And it may seem like the boring one, but it's definitely safest at the moment. Thanks, Yasmin. Just an extension question for Claudia. Is there any data coming through regarding vaping? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. No, I mean, we don't have enough data on smoking as it is, let alone vaping. Um, the little bit of research that I did in this area showed that some people use vaping as a way of quitting smoking. I didn't, uh, in my study, I didn't include any people who were vaping separate from smoking. So people that had never smoked, but went on to vaping. Um, but that might definitely be more um, prevalent in the future. I guess one thing to say about vaping is that um, while some people say that it's safer than smoking, it's by no means safe. Um, it's at the moment very poorly controlled, so we don't know what sort of chemicals are in there. And it is likely that there are a lot of different harmful chemicals in there. So I would recommend staying away from vaping unless you've had you know, discussions with your healthcare provider and, and they've recommended it to you. Great. Third question from me is what makes it hard, do you think, for people living with MS to actually adhere to these different recommendations for healthy living? I can go first if you want. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, when it comes to, um, you know, quitting smoking, we all know that that's really difficult. Um, you know, nicotine is in the top three of the most addictive substances. So we all know that it is really difficult. I myself used to smoke. I quit probably about 17, 18 years ago now. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to quit. Um, and, you know, you're up against the, the tobacco industry. They're very cunning. They use a lot of tricks to get people hooked on cigarettes and they, they just make it really hard to quit by, you know, enhancing addictive qualities of the cigarettes and using, you know, using, um, uh, design features like filters, which get the smoke even deeper into your lungs, making it, yeah, making it even harder to quit. Um, and I guess for specifically for people with MS, the things that can make it even more harder to quit is if you have symptoms, if, for instance, like depressive symptoms or anxiety or pain, because it can sometimes feel like those symptoms get a little bit worse when you quit smoking. Um, and that's often temporary. And in the long term, you're actually better off. 
Um, but that can make it really hard. So if you're already already struggling with pain, for instance, and you try to quit smoking and you feel like that's making it worse, um, you know, obviously that makes it harder to quit smoking again. So I guess one thing that I would like to emphasize is that it is really, really important to get um, all the support you can get if you're trying to quit smoking. Uh, and that uh, the best combination is often um, to, to use a combination of quitting medication and counseling. And then especially if you have some of those symptoms like pain or depression, um, it will be really beneficial to try and tackle those as well um, to give yourself the best chance of, of quitting successfully. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, lead on from that and move back to the exercise physical activity space. So historically, um, back 30, 35 years ago, I guess recommendations coming from healthcare clinicians was to rest when you were diagnosed with MS. But now there's been 20, 25 years of ex, um, exercise based research showing that there are so many benefits to that. And there really, there really is no um, adverse events associated with much of the exercise literature that we're aware of. So we can recommend that it is now safe for most people with MS to participate in physical activity and exercise. But I guess when it comes to some reasons why people might not, we have started asking individuals with MS what the reasons behind their behaviour or lack of an exercise lifestyle might be. And often it can be a lack of understanding as to what they can do and how they can bring that into their life, how they can manage um, all the other parts of their life and add into that physical activity or advance what they're already doing. Um, also, when it comes to understanding what the recommendations are and what they should be doing, it's making sure that clinicians are all aware what they can recommend to their, to their clients and where they can refer their clients so that they do have exercise specialists, exercise physiologists, physiotherapists who can guide them appropriately. Um, and then, of course, it's important to remember that the general population don't tend to be that active. So it isn't just because individuals have been diagnosed with MS. There's a lot of barriers in their lifestyles that make it really simple for us to jump in a car and go to the shops rather than taking the opportunity to get exercise by walking or potentially cycling. Um, and then there can be other social barriers that make it difficult for people to exercise or participate in physical activity. On the flip side of that, there's lots of things that we can realise in our lives can make it easier to be more physically active. So there are many fun parts towards exercise as well. And doing that socially can be something that makes it easier for you to bring into your life. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the social side because that's a that's a big driver, I think, for me with the food side of things as well. Um, I guess both as a as a person um, with MS, but also as a dietitian, I think food is really important to most people's lives. But the placement of food in people's lives varies a lot. Um, we know that those who choose a better or make better food choices generally have less symptoms and have better disease progression in the MS space in particular. Um, but again, like I said, we don't have any particular guidance messages specific to the MS population. So I think it's really being aware of the choices that you are making and thinking about, do, is there a better choice that I could be making right now? You know, not labelling foods as bad foods or good foods, but just could I be swapping this to something different, something that's a bit better? I mean, the general population don't meet dietary guidelines. So it's not surprising that I guess the MS population probably aren't either. We don't know that quite yet, um, but I think we can always work towards improving our behaviours. And by improving our behaviours, there's such a connection between a lot of these lifestyle elements um, that, you know, if you make one change, it tends to flow on and have effects to other areas as well, making you feel better overall, making others around you feel better, making you feel more social and, and, and it just expands outwards. So I think there are so many factors that do have direct effect, I guess, as symptoms of the disease um, but there are also a lot of social factors that can be really quite helpful for us to make positive changes. Yeah and just extending on that a little bit Yasmin obviously we are aware that um, there can be a number of symptoms that are quite disabling for people who have been diagnosed with MS um, mobility might be reduced but fatigue is probably a symptom that affects the majority of the population 
so realizing that we can make these lifestyle changes and that in the long term they can benefit our symptoms is important to always remember and think about think about short-term goals when it comes to making lifestyle changes but also the the larger picture of how that should um, improve your lifestyle over a number of years as well and again prevent you getting them um, other diseases in the long term yeah are there, are there any like strategies in your respective um, disciplines that people can use to overcome some of those barriers yeah um I can again speak from the exercise physical activity background space so we we know that if people introduce exercise into their lifestyle supported by psychological behavior change techniques so that's these aren't as scary as they might sound and um, mm -hmm. these are things like learning and speaking to experts about what are the appropriate changes to bring into your life depending on what your situation is what your symptoms are what your family home life is um, and also that word that I mentioned earlier on, goal setting. So thinking about small steps that you can really introduce to your life and easily achieve and seeing that you can easily make those changes can give you the incentive to make the next change and to maybe aim for a larger change or a longer maintenance of a positive health change in your life. And thinking about what might be difficult for you and why it's difficult for you to make that change and writing that down. What is the problem that's stopping you making that change? And then problem solving, perhaps on your own, but potentially with experts to help you about how you can overcome those barriers or just some of the simple steps that we in the exercise space match up together and to make it easier for individuals to benefit from being active in their life and I think probably those are the steps that are brought into um, interventions and programs based on nutrition as well Yasmin you can potentially let us know. Yeah there's definitely a lot of overlap there uh, for things that could be applied to um, nutrition space as well um, but I think like I alluded to previously the idea of seeking help from those around you so don't try and do it all on your own um, you know small steps along the way can make big changes in the long term, um, but also asking for help, asking for advice from people, listening to what your healthcare professionals tell you, which often people forget to do. Um, you know, those are really important things along the way. And if you are worried about what you're eating, seeking advice in that space, you know, don't go and Google it and figure it all out yourself. You know, ask them from those who really do, those who are in the know, um, and that'll definitely give you the right information at the time. Yeah, and I've alluded to it a little bit already when it comes to quitting smoking. Um, I guess the first step would be to really understand the, the benefits of quitting smoking. And you can find information about that on the MS Australia website, for instance, what the specific benefits are for people with MS. Um, but then, as Yvonne also mentioned before, quitting smoking obviously prevents you from getting lots of other diseases as well, um, you know, like lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. In terms of the best way of quitting smoking, um, as I mentioned there, you know, the combination of having um, quitting medication and counseling is has been shown to be the, the best and the most effective way. So quitting medication can include nicotine replacement therapy. So the patches and chewing gums that most people would be aware of, but there's also other medications uh, like uh, bupreon, I can never pronounce it right, um, that can help you. So I would definitely um, suggest that people talk to their GP about that. Um, but then there's, you know, lots of other organizations that provide free support. So you have the quit line that you can call for free. Um, there's phone apps that you can download um, for free that, um, you know, help you, for instance, by showing you how much money you're saving if you quit today or if you cut down, for instance. Um, and then again, coming back to also what Jasmine has said, um, you know, really getting the help from people around you. So telling your partner or your friends or the people that you live with um, how important it is for your MS and for your well-being that you quit and asking them to help you support that decision and, um, you know, help you get through difficult moments, for instance, can be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Final question we have for the panel, for someone who's newly diagnosed with MS, should their healthcare team start talking about lifestyle self-management? 
I think I've briefly touched on this before um, when I was explaining when I was first diagnosed. And I think I think it's different for everybody. Um, some people are accepting of change. They're accepting of the diagnosis. Maybe for them it was a long time coming and it's kind of that confirmation and it's a relief. For others it's a shock um, and a time that's very overwhelming. So I guess it depends on the person um, and it depends on, on the team around. So if it's someone that has the expertise in the area of lifestyle management that the person needs, I think it's better received than if it's coming from in a bit of a generalist perspective from someone who may be a health clinician but may, may not, not be specialised in that particular area. So indirectly, um, yes and no, I suppose. Um, you know, newly diagnosed, there's a lot going on, a lot of information that comes your way. Disease-modifying therapy is probably the main target for your neurologist. And can you handle any more information at that point is probably the factor that needs to come into play. Yeah, I also touched on it briefly before um, in the sense that the survey that I did a few years ago showed that um, the majority of people did want to hear this information within the first month of diagnosis. But I completely agree with what Jasmine said. I think it's so dependent on the individual situation and what's going on, um, you know, how completely shocked they might be or potentially they already suspected it and are ready to make changes in their lives. Um, there is a there is a concept from the literature that's called the teachable moment, um, which is the time when someone is diagnosed with a chronic or life changing illness, and people are more likely to make changes at that time um, if they believe that that's going to impact um, you know their health in a in a in a substantial way. So potentially there are people that would really benefit from hearing that information at that time at that teachable moment. Um, but I think, you know, you have to proceed with caution and uh, check in with that person to make sure you're not overwhelming them with information and things to do. Yeah, and just to expand um, a little on both of your points. So there really would be no reason to not be promoting um, physical activity and exercise to everyone prior to a diagnosis of MS um, or once they do find out that they do have the condition. And yes, I agree that there's, there would be steps at, as and when we could have that discussion and when we can first tell them about it, but there would be no harm in planting that seed early on. And it's, it's also something that people can take on board and do on their own. They can, they can handle themselves, the lifestyle changes in that it's not a medication that they have to be prescribed. It is something that they can actively change within themselves and they can take ownership of handling that part of their management of um, their health. Um, so another sort of point embedded in your question there, Karen, about should the healthcare team be discussing it with them? I think it's important to make sure that the healthcare team are sending out consistent information and that the neurologist and the nurses and the physios and the psychologists and the nutritionists are all providing the same sort of information within their within their areas of expertise so to answer your question directly I agree with Yasmin that there's different different ways we want to approach this for individuals but making sure that the message is consistent across the healthcare team. I think that's been really insightful. Thank you so much to our panel. I hope this has provided everyone online with some great insight into these challenges um, that people living with MS face and how they try and self-manage their condition. For the last few minutes, um, we have time for question and questions and answers from anybody in the audience, for anybody, any of our speakers for today. So I'll hand over back to Yasmin for this part. Thank you both. I have got a question in the net that's come through um, the chat function and it's for you, Olivia. Um, so the question is in, in relation to the literature, is there somewhere in the literature where self-reports of the levels of physical activity might be found? For example, if people with MS are actually meeting the recommended physical activity levels? I can probably only speak to what 
research has come through in my review and what evidence sources I've retrieved. Um, and definitely there is a mix of both subjective and objective measures of physical activity. So actually a few of these evidence sources used questionnaires where the participants in those studies actually self-reported their level of physical activity, whether that be no physical activity, half an hour, an hour or more. Um, Yvonne might be or have a greater awareness of the literature outside of this review as well and see if there, it sounds like if there is some kind of portal that people can self-report their activity type as well. So I might even jointly answer that and see if you have any insight there, Yvonne, as well. Um, just to, so Yasmin, just to understand the question, is it is there somewhere that people can go to report what their current physical activity is and know if it's appropriate? So or... I guess in the literature, is there anywhere, are there any self-reports um, of levels of physical activity? So people, are they actually meeting the levels that they're requiring to meet? So we tend to measure physical activity over two methods, so patient self-reported outcomes. Um, there's two main ones, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire and the Godan Leisure Time Exercise Questionnaire. But also we want to, and those are self-reported, like um, Olivia was saying, that people say how much they do. The, the second and perhaps more objective mechanism is using accelerometers. Um, and these are found on our smartphones and they're found in our smart watches. But most of the research that is used these is ask people to wear them on their hips and just live their regular life for three to five to seven days and we monitor how much physical activity they're doing. And sadly, or um, unsurprisingly, perhaps the general consensus is that individuals living with AMS are doing less physical activity than the general population. And in some cases, they're doing less physical activity than people living with other chronic health conditions. Um, and Claudia and I um, did a study a few years ago looking at the Australian MS population, and that one was focused on whether or not they were achieving the exercise guidelines, and the general trend suggested that they weren't, um, and that was based on information we got through the Australian MS Longitudinal Study, which is supported by the University of Tasmania and is Australia-wide. Um, and just to comment upon that, whilst a lot of people were being aerobically active, the majority of individuals weren't undertaking strength um, and conditioning exercise, which, as I mentioned, is the sort of vital second component to being physically active and undertaking exercise in particular, because it has a wealth of benefits um, for our lifestyle and our health as we, as we get older in particular. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. I just popped a um, link to two papers, um, one of which Yvonne just talked about in the Q&A, if anyone's okay. interested. Thanks, Maria. Um, I have just another question here for you, Karen. Um, so if someone, if someone wanted to find out what they should be doing, where should they go to look for it? I guess this is probably nutrition related. Given um, what we talked about earlier, the best place to go would probably be one of the MS organisations like MS Plus um, as a trusted source of evidence-based information. And another place they could go is their healthcare provider as well, so members of their healthcare team. Thanks, Karen. You're quite popular, Olivia. You've got another question. <laughs> um, how do you measure brain health? <laughs> the magic question. That is a very tricky question and um, something I think self-reflecting on as well after the review, um, or I've started to develop this review on brain health. Uh, what I've found from the evidence sources that I've retrieved, I've kind of split them all measures of brain health under two key umbrellas. So just like, I guess, in a way, physical activity, it came through from both subjective and objective reporting measures of brain health. So the objective being very strongly focused on MRI outcomes. So I think it happened to be the, the stat was around 70% actually of evidence sources that included a measure was actually through MRI. And I mentioned a couple of those measures in my presentation as well. So lesion count, brain volume or atrophy over time. 
And then the objective measures is through questionnaires or indices. And that really looked at reserve building mechanisms of brain health. So might have been education status, leisure activity, or even IQ as well. So two different umbrellas, but again, there's no one gold standard measure of brain health. And I think that probably stems from the variability that's out there in the literature with regards to Firstly, I think we need to understand what is this concept and then build on that. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, we've got another one that's come through for you, Yvonne. Um, so this one's in relation to the barriers towards physical activity for people with MS. Do they have access to exercise professionals as part of regular care? So for example, a physio exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist? Um, that can be very much almost a postcode lottery, I think. Um, it depends who, where you are um, and it will depend who your neurologist has when it comes to their multidisciplinary team. So the other healthcare team members that they've got around them. Um, but I do believe that there are a number of neurologically specialising um, exercise physiologists um, across Australia and equally a little bit more when it comes to physiotherapists. So both of those professions should be what you're, should be who you're requesting from your um, MS team to have referrals to and having access to EPs or physios can really be good to good experts to enhance your knowledge of the benefits of exercise and what you can be doing and the starting point for you to include it in the rest of your life but I guess it'll depend on on where people are based and which um which really which clinic they're associated with and whether or not that clinic does have EPs but the more the merrier as far as far as I'm concerned so the evidence is strong for the need and the benefit of exercise and if if we can have more specialists in that field, I think that would be better overall. Completely agree. All right, well, I might need to close today's discussion. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, but do any of our panelists have any final remarks that they might like to leave the audience with? So Olivia, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I can jump on first. I think <laughs> Sorry. Um, we nicely outlined it, and I guess coming from my presentation and from my experience with the literature so far, there is so much variability and inconsistency. So I think when people living with MS are Googling things or they're reading things online, it can be really confusing. So I think from the research perspective, and I guess also with a clinician hat on as well, I really encourage clinicians um, or if it's people with MS to really be speaking the same language. I think to break down that barrier of inconsistent messaging, which can create confusion, which then leads to, um, I guess, mismanagement of MS. So speaking the same language would be my take home. Okay, Karen. I suppose just reflecting on um, dietary guidelines and perhaps the perception that, oh, that's the official recommendation. It means that there's no change. But thinking that only like less than 4% of Australians actually follow the dietary guidelines. So when we think about that, that figure's not likely to be very different in people living with MS. So greater adherence to a balanced diet involves a lot of positive change. So don't, I hope that the message isn't that that involves no change at all. Something to think about. I know I could do better. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia? Um, you know, when it, yeah, when it comes to smoking, um, I think it's a no-brainer. It's a Quitting smoking is the best decision you can make. I can speak from experience, but it is really difficult. So try and get all of the supports that you could possibly get around you. And, you know, uh, it, sometimes it takes a few quit attempts before you can really, really um, kick the habit for, for life. Anyone? Yeah, um, I guess if people want to learn a little bit more about all of these topics, if they were to go into the MS Australia website, um, a couple of years ago, all three of us were involved in publishing a modifiable lifestyle document to make recommendations for people living with MS when it comes to diet, when it comes to physical activity, when it comes to smoking cessation and other topics as well. So there's, there's one of those available for people living with MS, but there's also one of those available for clinicians. So for allied healthcare providers who have patients with MS, 
for nurseries and for neurologists. I would say that reading over those um, reading over those information leaflets would be really, really useful and having them on hand to refer back to because this is really similar to what we've been talking about today. And obviously, Karen and Olivia's research is really going to be advancing that in particular for um, nutrition and brain health. Beautiful. Well, a big thank you to all of you, to Olivia, Karen, Claudia and Yvonne for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Also, thank you to the audience. We hope you really enjoyed today's discussion. This event was recorded, so everyone who has registered will receive a recording via email. And again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.